Good morning, and we welcome you to our worship on this Sunday morning, August the 30th, 2020. We are very glad that you are with us this morning, wherever you are joining us in the country or the world. And we're grateful for your watching and listening to our video. Would like to give thanks this morning to our musicians, to Mr. Saunders Allen, to Kelly Young, to Lucas Arzaius, to Brandon Shaw McKnight, and Christopher Chappelle, our musicians, and also to Scott Lilienthal for his videographer gifts. We are most grateful for their time and their gifts in ministry. This morning we begin with singing hymn number 675, Take Up Your Cross, The Savior Said. the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good works, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the third chapter of Exodus, verses 1 to 15. Moses was taking care of the flock for his father-in-law Jethro, Midian's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert, and he came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it didn't burn up. Then Moses said to himself, Let me check out this amazing sight and find out why the bush isn't burning up. When the Lord saw that he was coming to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, I'm here. 
Then the Lord said, Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, because you are standing on holy ground. He continued, I am the God of your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God. Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land that's full of milk and honey, a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites all live. Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you, and this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I now come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they are going to ask me, what's this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God continued, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how all generations will remember me. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Gospel reading this morning is Matthew 16, verses 21 to 28. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? For the human one is about to come with the majesty of his father with his angels, and then he will repay each one for what that person has done. I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see the human one coming in his kingdom. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How not to be part-time disciples in a full-time world. Jesus' words are very clear in today's gospel. Jesus has no part-time disciples. Now, I'm guessing that the first disciples didn't think they were part-time disciples. Yes, they still had to pay taxes to Caesar, whom they hated. Yes, they still had to adhere to the basic tenets of the Jewish faith, even though they sometimes interpreted those tenets a bit too liberally for the Pharisees. There was, after all, that little kerfluffle every time Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath. But for the most part, Jesus and his disciples practiced their faith to what seems like the best of their abilities. Now, as we read today's Gospel, we must remember that Matthew is looking back in history. Matthew is writing this gospel around the year 85 of the Common Era. This is 15 years after Mark's gospel was first read among Jewish believers, Christian believers who were Jewish, and about 55 years after Jesus had died. So what Matthew, when Matthew writes last week, in last week's gospel reading that Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, that's rather anachronistic. In other words, in the historical moment, as Jesus and his disciples are headed to Jerusalem for the last time, there is no institutional Christian church yet. That doesn't happen till later. All there is in this moment is a traveling band of men and women devoted to Jesus of Nazareth and the Jesus movement. All these men and women know for sure in this moment is that this man from Galilee speaks and lives a kind of truth they do not usually hear anywhere else, whether that is synagogue, temple, or the street. Jesus is a charismatic leader. His message about God's love and the need to live out this love in concrete ways and deeds is compelling, clear, and countercultural. As they travel with Jesus, the disciples see the potential of Jesus' teachings, healings, miracles that transform the lives of them and their people. But, you may ask, exactly what is the end game of all this transformation? Well, that depends. Some of the disciples hope that Jesus will do something revolutionary, like overthrow Rome and take power back for the Jewish people. Perhaps Judas is one of these. I wonder 
when we know Judah's full story someday, what we will learn is that Judas betrayed Jesus in order to force Jesus' hand with this goal. Like, well, if I turn him into the Jewish authorities, then finally Jesus will have to make a political move. And then we will all be free of these brutal Romans. Then when Jesus showed that Judas had misunderstood the kind of kingdom that Jesus wanted to bring to reality, Judas realized he had made a huge mistake, but it was too late. And Judas could not live with the burden of that mistake. We don't know the end of that story yet. What we do know is that at this point in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' ministry is very successful. His fame has spread all over Galilee. He's busy healing, teaching, casting out demons. And at this point, Jesus' disciples are focused on everyday life with their teacher. Like, where are we camping tonight? Where are we going tomorrow? Who's buying supplies this week? How are we supposed to meet the needs of all these people? We liked all the fanfare at first, but now none of us has a minute to ourselves, and Jesus looks more and more exhausted every day. Now, at some point in history, it's true. Simon Peter did become the head of this official sect that became known as the Way, then Christians. It's also clear that when Matthew writes this gospel, it's before Jesus has been betrayed, tortured, crucified. He's risen from the dead and gone back to God by the time Matthew writes these words. And so what Matthew writes is after the fact. In last week's gospel, Jesus told Peter that he will become the foundation of of the church and then lest Simon Peter's head get too big Jesus told him exactly what that looks like being the head of Jesus church is not about pomp and circumstance it is not about glory it is not about wielding power it is not about getting the best seat at the banquet it is not about getting driven all over town in a lavish gold chariot. It is not about people bowing and scraping like they have no opinions or spines. No. If you follow Jesus, it's a full-time job. And always, always, the shadow and reality of the cross will loom large across your life. We may wonder why Peter didn't get it yet, but he couldn't get it yet. This is before Judas' betrayal and Jesus' brutal death. This is before all the disciples huddle in an upper room, unable to believe Mary Magdalene when she insists the Lord is alive. Peter only wants the teaching, the healing, the miracles. He loves the possibility of glory, power, privilege. Yet even before they get to Jerusalem, the shadow of that cross looms larger every minute. Jesus tries in vain to tell these men and women that they're going to have to pick up their cross if they really want to follow him. Now, we must not cast aspersions on Peter. If the disciple who walked and talked with the historical Jesus didn't quite understand what following Jesus would really mean, do we? After all, Simon Peter was there in the moment. We are 2,000 years removed from that world. We are not thrown into jail because we say we are Christians. We may not be killed for our belief in Jesus. Yet we stand with Peter and the others. Like Peter, we love our pursuit of human things. We want to be independent, self-made, and self-reliant. Getting ahead and getting enough to live comfortably is the goal. Most of us live in a context that rewards those sorts of values. And when we look for a church, we don't mean to, but we seek a community that feeds our spiritual needs and the needs of our family. 
And the central figure in that narrative is self, not Jesus. And the assumption is that the smart church will develop a marketing strategy that will reach consumers like us, right? Yes, we profess to follow Jesus, but what does that really look like in our daily lives? Do we just fit Jesus into the empty space in our calendar? How convenient or inconvenient does the gospel make our Monday, Tuesday, Thursday? Do we pretty much dress up the cross and put it on to wear like jewelry around our neck? Or do we move ourselves aside to live the way Jesus lived? When push comes to shove, who really is number one in our lives? Jesus or me? So, Jesus is not into comfort. Jesus did not come to make us happy. Jesus is not about making us feel good. When we do a little kind deed to someone less fortunate. Jesus asks us to put God first every day with big things and with little things. And Jesus calls us to real tough discipleship. He asks us to make the way of the cross the way of life. What's important to Jesus is that we're willing to give up. We may have to give up our hard-held beliefs about a particular way of worship or a particular ministry that we have ownership of and that makes us comfortable. Jesus asks us to go deeper, to ask ourselves what might shape us more deeply as his disciples in a 21st century world. So, maybe in this unsettled time, it's time to do something different than we have done, something outside our comfort zone, like maybe we join a Bible study Maybe we begin a habit of reading a Bible story to our children every night. If we don't already say grace before a meal, maybe we begin this good habit. In other words, we may say we belong to Jesus, yet if we were standing in a courtroom accused of being a disciple, is there enough evidence to really convict us? Now, if you ask me for examples about how to live as if our faith matters, here are two real examples. In 1965, a white Episcopalian seminarian, Jonathan Myrick Daniels, was deeply moved by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's televised appeal to justice. King's words helped Jonathan understand that a gospel stance was countercultural in an American society that elevated white skin over black or brown skin. America's racism denied many the power of reality of voting. One night at evening prayer in General Seminary, as Jonathan listened to the Magnificat, he hath put down the mighty from their seat and hath exalted the humble and meek. Daniels knew that he could no longer talk the Jesus talk if he did not walk the Jesus walk. So he traveled by bus to Selma, Alabama, where he joined a picket line and got thrown into jail. Now, unexpectedly, he was released from jail, but he was aware that he and his companions were in danger. So they walked to a small store nearby, and there, a 16-year-old girl named Ruby Sales reached the top step of the store's entrance, only to be confronted by a man with a 12-gauge shotgun. The white man swore at the young black girl, and Jonathan jumped in front of her and shielded her with his body. Jonathan Daniels was killed by a blast from that 12-gauge shotgun. You and I may never be called, like Jonathan Daniels, to die for our Christian beliefs. He put his money where his mouth was. And yet I think that in this day and time, it might be helpful to ask if we are willing to put our faith into real actions. How do we live a faith 
that people have been willing to die for? How do we live a faith that makes a difference? Now, sometimes making that difference is not as dramatic as that incident in Selma. A second less dramatic example is former President Jimmy Carter, who apparently still lives in a ranch-style home valued at about $167,000 he built himself in 1961 in Georgia. It's said that he and Rosalind, his wife, both up in their 90s, make their own yogurt, and sometimes he buys his clothes at the Dollar General Store. Pre-COVID, Carter often flew commercial airlines where sometimes he walked up and down the aisle shaking hands with fellow passengers. President Carter did not just adopt this modest lifestyle after he left the White House. In fact, many people scorned his habit of wearing sweaters, a la Mr. Rogers, and turning down the thermostats all over the White House while he was there. Yet, whenever you th whatever you think of Carter's politics or his frugal tendencies, you have to admire a man whose Christian principles shape his life. He still teaches Sunday school. At 95 years old, Carter says his greatest accomplish accomplishments were in keeping the peace and supporting human rights. When he helped broker peace between Israel and Egypt, at the Camp David Accords in 1978. And even now at 95, Carter spends his time focused on others as he still literally helps build houses for Habitat for Humanity projects. In short, Jimmy Carter doesn't just talk the Jesus talk, he walks the Jesus walk. So the question is, do you do that? Think about what you put in the center of your day, the center of your calendar page, the center of your life. Has it got something to do with Jesus? Has it got anything to do with Jesus? What are you gonna teach your children about how to put Jesus first? And if you don't right this minute put Jesus first in your life, what would you need to do to change that? Ask yourself if you are a part-time disciple in a full-time world. And if you are and want to reverse that, look around. I'll bet right now in history you can find some way to change the focus of life from you to Jesus and what he believes in. It may not be a glamorous way. It may get you no recognition. And yes, it may take some courage. Yet even if you pick up that cross and feel some weight, you will also feel set free, perhaps in ways you never imagined. Today, I invite you to commit to becoming a full-time disciple of Christ in this crazy, chaotic, full-time world. You will never be sorry. Amen.
say together our baptismal creed, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O God, the Almighty and Holy One, in whose light and wisdom we faithful walk, we pray to you this day. Your children come before you in faith and hope, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, God, that you have answered our fears with love. Give to us the faith to go where others dare not to proclaim the vastness of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, God, that you aid those who work for justice and peace by giving them courage, vision, and strength. Enlist all people in the struggle for human dignity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, God, for our church and its leaders. We pray today especially for our presiding bishop, Michael, for our diocesan bishop, Mary Ann, for assisting bishop, Chilton, for Sheila and Robert, our priests, and for all clergy and lay ministers who proclaim your word with words and actions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all nations. We pray for United States leaders, the president and cabinet, the Senate and House of Representatives, for governors, mayors, and all who are in authority. May they make wise decisions and set aside all differences in order to work to make the lives of all people better, regardless of political affiliation, race, social, or economic status. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all among us who are ill, or depressed, or lonely, we pray today for those on our parish prayer list, for Edie, Flossie, Jean, the Burke family, for Joe, Charlotte, Bill and Mary Ann, Bertha and Paul, Sophia, Daniel, Molly, Herb, Donna, Derek, Lilia, Gloria, Stephanie, Deb, Bill and Kara, Julie, Teresa, Jenny, Rebecca, and Teresa. We also pray for the recovery of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, who was shot seven times in the back this week. Pray for this child of God and for all who love him, and pray for peace in this nation and in Kenosha. We pray for those who have died, especially for the repose of the souls of Daria Reistma, daughter of Jim Mattoon's niece, for Dr. Chadwick Aaron Bozeman, actor, for the 180,000 people who have died so far in the United States from COVID-19, and for the 820,000 who have died worldwide. May all these children of God rest in peace and rise in glory with God's saints. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give God thanks for all our blessings. Today we give thanks for all your children who are now mercifully recovering from this virus 
or other illnesses. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we bring these and all our needs to you, filled with confidence in the power of your love, wisdom, and mercy. Hear us and answer our prayer. We ask this through Christ, who is our risen Lord, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray in the words our Savior Christ has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As you go your way this day, I pray that you go in peace. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love, this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.